Okay. Hello, everybody. It's so good to see you out there. Hello, universe. Welcome to the first in a brand new series of panels brought to you by the University of Washington's Astrobiology Program. My name is Mike Wong, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in the UW Astrobiology Program. And tonight, I'm joined by four of my fellow scientists who are all driven by their curiosity about the possibility of life in the universe. So let me go ahead and start sharing these introductory slides. So tonight, our four panelists will deliver arguments for why the planetary body that they study is the best place to search for life out there. And at the end of this moderated debate, which will last around 40 minutes, you'll have the chance to ask questions of our panelists through the chat box on YouTube. And you'll also get to vote for the location that you think is the best place to search for life in the universe. So without further ado, let's begin by getting to know our panelists. And we'll start with Trent Thomas. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so uh, I'm Trent. I'm a first year PhD student in planetary sciences and astrobiology. And one of my primary research interests is the ancient climate of Mars. And so today I will be arguing for why Mars is the best place to look for life in the universe. Um, so I'll start by immediately conceding that actually uh, present day Mars isn't the most pleasant place for life. Uh, there's almost no atmosphere. Uh, it's on average about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. However, um, this wasn't always the case. There is plenty of evidence that liquid water flowed on the ancient Martian surface. And uh, with liquid water on the surface, uh, that implies uh, warm, perhaps Earth-like conditions and a warm climate. Um, if this wasn't the case, that water uh, would have frozen or would have even boiled off. And so uh, with Earth-like conditions in an Earth-like climate, you can expect Earth-like habitats. Uh, things like lake environments, maybe shallow ponds and puddles on the surface, uh, or even hydrothermal vent systems. And so from a conceptual standpoint, Mars is a great place to look for life because it presents many of these Earth-like environments. Um, we have life on Earth, uh, probably formed here somehow in one of these perhaps very important environments. Uh, so why not on Mars as well? And uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, Mars is just close. Um, and relative to the rest of the solar system, uh, Mars is one of our planetary neighbors. Uh, it's like the moon or Venus, and it's much easier to get to Mars than it is to get to some of these uh, farther out solar system bodies. So the cost benefit analysis now of going to Mars is uh, just very strong and uh, we can get there for cheap, we can get there fast. Um, so for both of these reasons, uh, I think I'd like to say that's why uh, Mars is the best place to look for life in the universe. Excellent. A strong opening statement for the red planet. Let us now travel beyond the asteroid belt to a moon of Jupiter called Europa and hear from Adriana Gomez Buckley. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Adriana Gomez Buckley. Um, I'm a post baccalaureate research assistant in the astrobiology program at UW. And today I'm representing Europa, which is the topic of my research. Uh, more specifically, I model what microbial life would look like in Europa's ocean. So I'm gonna introduce it a little bit. Europa is one of the many moons of Jupiter. Um, of the four major Galilean moons, it's the second one out orbiting right after Io and taking about three and a half Earth days to make a full orbit around Jupiter. Um, with a diameter of around 3,100 kilometers, it's the smallest of the Galilean moons and that makes it just slightly smaller than our own moon. And that makes it the sixth largest moon overall in our solar system. Currently, um, we've only had a handful of flyby missions to Europa. They started in the 1970s. Um, there was a notable Galileo spacecraft that did a flyby in 1995 and got some cool data. And there was some other ones in more recent years. 
Jupiter itself is orbiting our sun at a whopping 778 million kilometers out. So Europa is a very chilly place ranging from about 140 to 50 Kelvin um, on the surface. But don't be fooled. This is still a very possible place for life. It has a thin atmosphere of oxygen um, and the surface might be icy, but it's what below, what's below the ice that interests us, which as I'm going to get into more later on in our panel with our moderated questions, is very likely a liquid saltwater ocean, liquid saltwater just like we have on Earth, and also some silicate rock just like our terrestrial planets. And this makes a lot of very interesting and promising chemistry that could support life. How exciting. And next out in the solar system is Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. And Lucas Pfeiffer will tell us about this one. Great. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Lucas Pfeiffer. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, I'm in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences and in the Astrobiology program. Um, and in my research, I study Enceladus, which you can see here. Uh, it's one of the many moons of Saturn. Um, and it's got this unusually kind of bright and white surface. Um, and it's a surface made entirely out of ice. Uh, the surface is super cold. It's around minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not anywhere uh, that we would want to live or probably most other kinds of life uh, would want to live. But underneath this thick outer uh, shell of ice, there is an ocean of liquid water. Um, and one of the main reasons we know that there is an ocean under the surface is that there are cracks in the surface near the South Pole where huge eruptions of gas and little bits of ice are uh, shooting out of these cracks and erupting hundreds of miles into space. Um, there was a, uh, sorry, a spacecraft mission called Cassini uh, that not only actually discovered these eruptions uh, for the first time in around 2005 and took images of them, um, it also flew through these eruptions and measured what was inside them. And there's strong evidence that uh, these eruptions originate from the ocean underneath the surface. So thanks to these eruptions, we know the kinds of gases and salts and different organic molecules that are in this ocean. Uh, and we're getting a taste of this ocean without having to deal with drilling through or otherwise getting through a very thick layer of ice that's like tens of miles thick. Um, and by understanding what is in this ocean, we can start to answer the question, is Enceladus a promising place to look for life? And so far, it seems like, uh, yes, it is a good place to look. Fantastic. And now for something completely different, exoplanets, worlds far beyond our solar system. Evan Davis will be arguing for them tonight. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Davis, and I'm also a post back research scientist. Uh, and I'm working with Dr. Victoria Meadows here at the University of Washington's astrobiology program. Uh, my work specifically focus on, focuses on how light from distant stars and the processes that are happening inside of these stars uh, influences the atmospheres of exoplanets that are orbiting them. And so naturally, my position uh, in this panel is going to be that of championing exoplanets. Now, exoplanets are simply just planets that are outside of our own solar system um, and that are orbiting other stars. Now, I can't speak to all exoplanets, but that's because there are so, so many of them. In the past decade, we've discovered thousands of planets outside of our own solar system, around hundreds of different stars. And so when we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe, why not look everywhere? Uh, the number of different kinds of environments that there are, uh, are uh, we're still coming to understand how many different uh, types of planets there are out there. And we're learning about more every day. Uh, now, not all of those are going to be uh, super, super great for life. Uh, some exoplanets are giant gaseous exoplanets like our own Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but some planets are more or less like uh, the terrestrial planets in our solar system, such as Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, and many of these planets uh, we're finding may uh, have compositions 
they may be made of the same things and have similar environments to uh, to bodies that are in our own solar systems, such as Mars, Europa, and and Enceladus. So uh, I think with that, the the pure number of exoplanets that exist out there and the different kinds of environments make for a fantastic, fantastic place to look for life. All right. Um, so with that, uh, that wonderful introduction to all of our different worlds tonight, uh, let's jump into the discussion. So tonight we're here to answer the question, what's the best place to look for life in the universe? And basically we're asking a question about planetary habitability. Can anybody give us a succinct succinct? Okay, I know you're all scientists, so you don't want to be succinct, but succinct definition of planetary habitability. I guess I'll take a stab at it. Um, so a very succinct definition um, of planetary habitability to me would be the potential to develop and maintain environments hospitable to life, uh, possibly with a little addendum on the end as we know it. Um, so we know that life can originate on a body or it can be transferred from another one. Um, this is known as panspermia. So basically if there's um, the surface of a planet and there's a large impact, some of it can get ejected into space and maybe could carry some primitive life forms with it that could be seeded on another planet. So again, it's a very broad definition, um, but I feel that this is because Earth is really our only observable example. So we only have a sample size of one. So when we're looking for um, habitable worlds, we tend to look for Earth-like planets. So we tend to look for planets that have the same or the same size or the same type maybe same location around their host star, um, have liquid water, same type of atmosphere, that kind of thing. But it doesn't really have to be the case. I think um, some of us will be talking about some planets that don't really fit all of those um, Earth-like definitions that are also considered habitable. I think that's a great answer. Does anybody have anything to add to that definition of planetary habitability? I think I, I could add a little bit. Um, so when we're thinking about habitability, there are some, some really important uh, ingredients that we need in order for life, at least as Adriana said, uh, Earth-like life to be possible. Uh, and so one of those main ingredients is water and liquid water to be specific. It's absolutely vital to all life on Earth uh, and without it, uh, it's very, very difficult to to maintain, to create and maintain life like we know it. Um, and so astrobiologists, when we're looking outside of the solar system at exoplanets, um, one of the main things that we're looking for is, um, is water. Um, another really important ingredient is energy. Um, we exist in our planet orbits our star at just the right spot to where it's receiving plenty of energy from the star, not too much, not too little, uh, but it's receiving the right amount of energy uh, from our star in order for life to be able to take advantage of that energy, in order for photosynthesis, which is what plants use to, uh, to create their energy. Um, that's that's a very important thing for life uh, on our planet. And we also need um, ingredients such as we need organic materials, organic chemicals such as carbon, hydrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, so on and so forth. Uh, so those are those are some ingredients that I think are very important uh, to look for when we're looking for life uh, in other places in the universe. So Evan, when you were talking about our planet being in the right spot, receiving just enough energy for things like liquid water. Were you talking about this concept of the habitable zone? I've heard that term thrown around a lot. What exactly is the habitable zone and how is it useful in our search for life? That's a great question, Mike. So the habitable zone is a tool that astrobiologists use all the time when we're thinking about where is the best place to look for life in the universe. Uh, now, I'm sure many of you out there in the audience remember the bedtime story, uh, Goldie Bear, or Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
Um, and if you remember, she first tries Papa Bear's porridge, and it's way too hot. You know, she she can't eat it. And then she goes and tries Mama Bear's porridge. It's too cold. She doesn't want to taste that either. But then she tries Baby Bear's porridge, and it's just the right temperature. She eats all of it up. And the habitable zone is kind of a similar situation, but instead of thinking about porridge, we're thinking about planets. And so the habitable zone is defined as the region around a star where uh, liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. And so you can imagine that if your planet is too close to the star, it's going to get very, very hot. And any water that would be on the surface of that planet is basically going to boil right off into the atmosphere where it's not super useful for life. Um, on the other hand, if your planet is too far away from the star, it can get very, very, very cold. Uh, and all of the water that's on the surface will just freeze over or in, when it's also not useful for life. But if you're in just the right spot and you're receiving enough light from your star, enough energy from your star, liquid water can exist on the surface of your planet. And as I said before, that's absolutely vital to, to life as we know it, Earth-like life. And so All astrobiologists right. are looking for that. All right. Well, let's talk about water freezing because we have got some frozen worlds here that we th think of as habitable. Europa and Enceladus exist well beyond the solar system's habitable zone as just defined, and yet we consider them to be habitable. So how is that possible? Uh, yeah, so, so right, so Enceladus and Europa, they're much too far away from the sun uh, to be in the habitable zone, so they can't have liquid water on their surfaces. Um, but there is, there is an energy that allows them to maintain oceans on the inside, and that energy actually comes from inside um, within, within these moons. So I know uh, specifically on Enceladus, it, it seems to be coming, this energy seems to be coming from friction within the core. Um, so we know kind of the overall mass uh, and in, in particular, the density of the different layers of Enceladus. So you've got kind of an outer layer of ice and then an ocean within that. And then at the very center, a rocky core. Um, but we think that that rocky core, it doesn't seem to be super densely packed. Um, so we think that it actually has quite a lot of holes in it. It's kind of porous, um, kind of like a sponge. Uh, and so water can kind of seep into that rock um, towards the center of Enceladus and fill the gaps in the rock. Um, and then there's a force acting on that rocky core, uh, and that's a tidal force, um, which is just when you have the gravitational uh, force of one object. So in this case, it's the gravitational force due to Saturn um, and its influence on Enceladus. So if, let's say I'm Saturn and this is Enceladus, um, the gravitational force on the side that uh, faces Saturn is stronger than on the opposite side. And as a result, Enceladus gets kind of like squished into a little bit more of a lemon or a football shape uh, than a perfect sphere. Um, although you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at it, it still looks like a perfect sphere. Um, and it's not just the outside that gets squished, it gets squished all the way through, inclu including the rocky core at the center. So it kind of rings out that core like a sponge and you get water coming out of the core. Uh, and then later the water can seep back in and you have water kind of going in and out and in and out. Uh, and as a result, you're generating friction between the water and the rock. Uh, and that, that is ultimately a source of heat that um, prevents Enceladus from freezing all the way through. Adriana, is the case very similar on Europa? Yes, it actually is. Um, in this case, though, it's Jupiter that's pulling on Europa. Um, and then in terms of like why we consider it to be habitable, so both Europa and Enceladus have water ice. Um, and as Evan had talked about, water is very essential to life as we know it in its liquid form. Um, and also we know that Europa is very similar in composition. So from, again, the bulk density measurements that were taken, um, they were able to determine that the core was likely a uh, silicate rock similar to our terrestrial planets. So again, we have um, an ice layer and then an ocean layer and then the core, which is silicate rock. And then that is driving these kind of reactions with the water. And as this like tidal heating and tidal flexing is occurring, um, there's going to be these fissures that are opening up in the rock 
to allow new faces of the rock to be exposed to the water and then therefore react and kind of create some chemical energy. And usually um, on Earth, that's not an issue. You see lots of hydrothermal vents and hydrothermal energy because our seafloor is constantly renewing itself. So you get all these hydrothermal vents along these like seafloor ridge lines. Um, but yeah, on a place like Europa, at least um, specifically, you'd see a lot of that because of just like fissures opening up in the rock. And then, so, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get the feeling that Europa and Enceladus, well, they sound very similar in terms of their situations, even though one orbits Jupiter and the other orbits Saturn. What makes one better than the other in terms of their potential for life? Oh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I, I don't wanna knock Europa too badly, um, but uh, there, there is a lot that we know about Enceladus that we just don't know about Europa yet. Um, in both cases, we know there's an ocean of liquid water, which of course uh, is very important for Earth-like life. Um, but with Enceladus, we know that some of the building blocks of life uh, that Evan mentioned earlier, they're in the ocean. So some of the little ice grains that came out in the eruptions, um, they contain organic molecules. Um, and organic molecules is kind of a confusing word. Uh, it's used in chemistry. It sounds like it's referring to molecules that are exclusive to living things, but it's not actually specifically saying that. Um, organic molecules are the building blocks of all parts of life as we know it, including uh, amino acids and proteins, um, our cell membranes, our DNA. Um, but they can also, some organic molecules are also produced by non-living things. Um, the molecules that were, the, or the organic molecules that were detected in the eruptions, um, they're much simpler than say DNA. Uh, they're the types of molecules that can be produced by life, but they can also be produced by things that aren't living. Um, but the point is that at the very least, the building blocks, we know they're there. Um, and the Cassini mission that visited Enceladus and measured these, it was kind of li limited in what it could measure. Um, so there might even be something with greater complexity um, that would be more strongly indicative of uh, active life that we just haven't found yet. Um, but the third thing that Enceladus really has going for it is energy. Uh, and while we have kind of some assumptions about uh, what might be going on within Europa, we have really strong evidence for a source of energy in Enceladus that life could use. Um, so even though the ocean's under the ice, there's no sunlight down there. Um, so like you can't have plants like seaweed, um, it's, it'll be pitch black down there, which is really creepy to think about. Um, but there is an alternative source of energy that comes again from inside. And uh, in this case, it's gases, dissolved gases in the ocean. Um, we know what gases are in the ocean thanks to the eruptions. And in particular, hydrogen and carbon dioxide are two gases that life can use to, uh, or life, sorry, these two gases like to react together in, generally, uh, in general. They like to create methane um, and life can kind of harness that reaction and use that energy to power its own, its own processes. Um, and that's a real type of life that exists on earth. Um, it exists within us. There are little methanogens inside us and inside cows, um, but also really interestingly at the bottom of the ocean near hydrothermal vents, um, which right. are theorized so, to be on Enceladus too. Oh, sorry. So Lucas gave a uh, whirlwind tour of why Enceladus is a great place for life. Adriana, do you have a rebuttal for why Europa is actually better? Yeah, so I have um, some reasons that Europa is very possibly habited and also um, some advantages that I think it has over Enceladus. Um, I wanna start off with talking about the chaos strain. So in that beautiful picture that was shown at the start, um, you saw maybe some brown stripes across Europa's surface and some interpret these stripes as places where the subsurface ocean has melted through the ice and then resolidified at the top. And they have that reddish brown color which is indicating some type of sulfur compound. And from the spectroscopic analysis, we think it might be something like magnesium sulfate or sulfuric acid hydrate, but basically both of these things indicate very good chemistry that can support life. And then also I wanna note that even without um, hydrothermal or volcanic activity, Europa could still be a very viable place for life. So um, as Lucas mentioned, Enceladus is the only place that has um, actual proof of hydrothermal vents or hydrothermal activity. Um, but I would argue that Europa probably has it too. Again, Europa is 
larger than Enceladus by quite a bit. So I think Enceladus is about 500 meters in diameter and Europa is 3,100 kilometers in diameter. So that just means more rock to get exposed to the ocean as the tidal heating is going on, tidal flexing. Um, so I would argue that there is hydrothermal activity, but even without it, there was a 2016 NASA study that found Earth-like levels of hydrogen and oxygen um, on Europa that could be produced from serpentinization, which is basically this rock coming into contact and reacting with the water, and also from ice-derived oxidants. So that's things that are getting kind of convected down from the ice because the ice on Europa is convecting. So basically that just tells us that there could be enough there to fuel chemosynthesis and chemosynthetic life just from the water's reaction with rocks and the influx of surface chemicals. And I think that one of my last points I have um, about why Europa might have an advantage over Enceladus is that Enceladus's ocean is thought to be a lot younger than Europa's. So Europa's ocean is thought to be uh, 4.5 billion years old, as old as Europa itself. And that's the same age as Earth, so that gives plenty of time for life to evolve. Um, whereas Enceladus's ocean is potentially a lot younger, it might have been triggered by a recent impact or new recent orbital dynamics um, in its history. So maybe just not enough time for life to evolve there yet in comparison to Europa. All right, all right. So Europa, Enceladus, plenty of liquid water, chemicals for life, energy underneath those icy shells. Trent, you know, Mars doesn't seem like it has any liquid water. It's just this rusty red world behind you. What makes Mars such a good place to look for life? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned uh, in my opening statement, um, the real key to this is ancient Mars um, and the evidence that there was liquid water flowing all over the surface of ancient Mars. Um, you can first see this just by looking at pictures of Mars. Uh, you can see just rivers and valley networks and deltas and things that were certainly you're like, that must have been caused by liquid water. Um, and a bunch of people thought that, of course, and so they took measurements. And the geochemistry has almost certainly confirmed that uh, there was liquid water flowing all over um, ancient Mars. And now on this ancient uh, Earth-like planet, which is ancient Mars, um, I like to categorize the potential habitats into three groups. Um, so there's surface environments in maybe small ponds or puddles. Uh, there's aqueous environments where microbes could live in lakes or things maybe even larger, closer to the size of oceans maybe. Um, and then there's the subsurface habitats where microbes could live um, kind of underground and munch on the chemicals in the rocks and the dirt. Um, and these three different types of habitats on Mars um, offer, first of all, a range of stability. So, for example, microbes living in the subsurface uh, would be kind of buffered against any crazy apocalyptic climate changes happening on Mars' surface. Um, and not only that, but they do also have um, a range of potential for abiogenesis which is kind of the spark you need to start up life in the first place. Um, on the surface, those um, kind of shallow ponds are a great place for life to start um, because the high energy um, light from the sun coming in is kind of diluted by the shallow amount of water. And it kind of, it, it, it's hypothesized that that can get to the right energy um, to really spark things up in the right way. Um, and so it's not, difficult to imagine that life may have started in one of those environments, migrated to another, and then kind of hunkered down for the long haul uh, in a subsurface reservoir. And even if that wasn't the case, uh, many of Mars's environments, for example, a lake environment, uh, would preserve fossils and microfossils of uh, long dead microbes, it would preserve them very well, um, because as a microfossil falls to the ground, the sediment in the lake just neatly and uniformly blankets it, um, and it's there for detection billions of years later by us. Um, so I would think that's the reason why the, the old dusty red world uh, is a little more complex. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, Evan, you know, compared to exoplanets, all the worlds that we've been talking about so far are basically in our cosmic backyard. We regularly send spacecraft like the rover behind Trent to these other worlds, but the closest exoplanet, you know, that would take us tens of thousands of years to reach with our fastest spacecraft. What makes you think that we'll find life on an exoplanet before we'll find life on any of these worlds in our solar system? So that's a great that's a great question, Mike. Uh, and you're absolutely right that uh, the nearest exoplanets to us are very far away. The closest exoplanet to us is Proxima Centauri b, and that's a, it's over four light years away. So that is 
well outside the range of our of our current rovers, our current uh, space missions, and it's going to be a long time before we're ever, you know, if we are ever able to send something there. Uh, however, we don't necessarily need to go to one of these planets in order to detect life on one of them or habitability. Um, in the past decade or so, we've discovered uh, over 4,000 exoplanets with missions like the uh, like Kepler and with Spitzer. And so with the sheer number of exoplanets that are out there, and by the way, this 4,000 exoplanets are only uh, in our local solar neighborhood. They're, in our, they're close to our star. And there are plenty, there are many, many, many stars in our galaxy, about 400 billion. And so there are a lot of planets just waiting to be discovered out there. Um, now, you might be thinking, okay, well, the number of planets doesn't necessarily mean that life would exist on any of them. How are we going to be able to tell if life exists on these planets? Well, astrobiologists are looking for what are called biosignatures on these planets that are orbiting other stars. And so biosignatures are basically uh, a coverall term for something that tells us that life may exist on these planets. And that can range from anything um, like uh, radio waves that are being emitted from a, uh, an advanced civilization on a planet, somewhat like our own, um, or they could be gases or mixtures of gases in a planet's atmosphere that scientists wouldn't exactly expect to find unless there was something else, potentially life, going on on these planets. And so with the search for biosignatures on the thousands, potentially millions of exoplanets that are, uh, that are out there, I think it's just a matter of time until we find life uh, on one of these exoplanets. So Evan, it sounds like there are thousands out there, like you said, over 4,000 with so many planets uh, beyond our solar system, we could probably spend the rest of the hour just listing them and not even get a fraction of the way through. Can you tell us maybe just about a couple of your favorite planets and their prospects for life? Mm. So uh, there, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of exoplanets out there and it can be difficult uh, to pick a favorite. But I think I speak for a lot of astrobiologists when I say that my favorite exoplanet system uh, would have to be TRAPPIST-1. Now, the TRAPPIST-1 system was discovered just a couple years ago. Um, and the TRAPPIST-1 star is a very, very, very small star. It's about as small as a star can be, um, which for a number of reasons makes it very easy for us to detect planets around them. Uh, and the TRAPPIST-1 system has not one or two or three or four or five or even six <laughs> planets. It has seven exoplanets uh, orbiting wow. it. Now, as I was talking about before with the habitable zone, some of those uh, planets, a couple of those planets, are too close to their star. And so they're a little too hot, maybe not a great place to look for life. Uh, a couple more of those planets are a little too far away from, from TRAPPIST-1, and so also maybe not a great place to look for life, but we don't know necessarily yet. However, three of those planets, TRAPPIST-1, D, E, and F, uh, are in the habitable zone of TRAPPIST-1. And so astrobiologists are very, very excited um, for next generation telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope, um, for telescopes like Louvoir and Habex and TESS to begin looking at um, TRAPPIST-1 and systems like it um, to be able to see whether or not uh, there are signs of life or signs of habitability on exoplanets. Yeah, sounds like we haven't yet reached the point where we can actually examine planets for life, exoplanets for life, but we're getting there soon. 
And the case is rather different for Mars, though, where we've been sending things to Mars for decades. And one common complaint I hear from planetary scientists is that, you know, Mars gets all this attention, but we still haven't found any definitive evidence for life there. So, so Trent, how would you respond to that criticism? Somebody who says, you know, Mars been there, done that. There's no life. Let's just move on. Yeah. So first, I would say we've certainly been there. Um, there have been plenty of missions to fly by, orbit, land, and rove on Mars. Um, and despite all of these missions and all of the scientific advancement um, we've made in the last 50 years almost of exploring Mars, I don't think we've sufficiently done that yet. I don't think we've had any um, high enough resolution and um, even theoretically unambiguous um, measurements to be taken that could confirm or deny life on Mars. And to give some examples of that, um, our first astrobiologi astrobiological exploration of Mars happened in the 70s, um, in 1975, um, with the Viking landers. And this was our first experiment where we, we knew at this point that Mars, there may be life there, and everyone was excited to find out. Um, so they designed a couple experiments um, to test the, the, the chemistry of the soil to see if microbes existed. Um, in retrospect, we know that this uh, experiment was kind of destined for failure. We, um, the resolution of the measurement at that time, combined with our lack of knowledge of the soil chemistry, means that we could not get an unambiguous life detection um, on Mars. And since then, uh, we've sent plenty more landers and rovers. Um, and one of the most important is the one behind me, um, Curiosity, landed in 2011. Um, and the primary purpose of Curiosity is to answer the question, um, could Mars have ever had uh, conditions to support microbial life? And so a lot of the claims I've made earlier in this panel are based on measurements taken by Curiosity, because um, I think it answered the question pretty well. Um, however, Curiosity was not equipped to make an unambiguous life detection. It could detect organics, um, but there's a difference and people are rightfully skeptical um, of detecting an organic versus detecting a real bona fide microbe. Um, and in the wake of this now, we've sent the Perseverance rover, it landed a couple months ago, Percy. Um, and Percy will be exploring a place called Jezero Crater, um, which is uh, perhaps one of the best places we could look for uh, remnants of microbes or even microbes that are still kind of hanging on uh, on the harsh conditions of Mars's surface. And Perseverance um, has some really advanced instruments that can uh, get very high resolution pictures uh, of what could be microfossils and, and remnants of these microbes. And it can also measure chemical compositions. Um, but I would argue that even um, the most promising returns from these measurements taken by Perseverance would still not be unambiguous and definitive to say that life um, exists on Mars. Uh, so an exhaustive search, I think, uh, is far from over and uh, would warrant much more uh, exploration and more funding. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking of more exploration and more funding, there is nothing currently orbiting Enceladus or Europa. Adriana and Lucas, can you give us some hints at what might be in store in the next coming years and decades? Yeah, so I, I definitely believe that we should start getting some missions out there to Europa and Enceladus. Um, I think they're very deserving of more missions. Um, some future missions that are planned right now, um, European Space Agency has something called JUICE, it's Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. Um, and then there's also NASA's Europa Clipper. And these two are kind of similar because they're both going to be flybys. Um, the Europa Clipper is gonna be more focused on Europa though. And uh, some exciting things that these can tell us, um, there's gonna be some thermal and digital imaging of the surface done. So maybe where future landers could land. Um, and there's going to be radar and magnetometers on there so we can observe um, how thick the ice shell is and then also constrain the ocean depth and the salinity and maybe find out something about currents. Um, and then also plenty of spectrographs, spectrometers and dust analyzers. So if there are plumes and material from plumes that they can capture, it could maybe analyze some composition. Um, in terms of actual landers though, um, there's nothing currently that's confirmed, but there's plenty um, that's in prototype stage. So a couple of my favorites are the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor or EELS, and that's an eel-like robot that could actually go around the surface, down crevice and into the water. 
And then also NASA's um, Bruy, which is the buoyant rover for under ice exploration. And it's basically this little rover that rolls around underneath the ice um, and is buoyant. So it can kind of sample maybe and analyze some stuff under the ice. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, Lucas, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, there are a few really cool like missions that could go back to Enceladus that are planned. There's one called Enceladus Life Finder um, or ELF and Enceladus Life Signatures and Habitability. They would both fly through uh, the eruptions and scoop up uh, some of that material, but this time with new and improved measurements, uh, new and improved instruments over what Cassini had. Um, so a different suite of instruments that's also just better suited to looking for life. Um, and there's one pretty cool mission uh, that is proposed, it's in development, um, is called the Enceladus Orbilander that would have an orbiter component that would do sort of similar things and to go around orbit and then fly through those uh, erupting plumes. Um, but it would also have a lander that would land somewhere near these eruptions uh, and it could sort of stick out a mechanical hand uh, and catch some parts of the eruptions that are falling back to the surface, in particular, little grains of ice that could uh, contain preserved life from the ocean, potentially. Very, very cool. I hope to see some of those fly to those worlds someday. Um, now it is time to open up the voting and let our speakers have uh, a one minute uh, closing remark about each of their places. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post this link in the YouTube chat. You can use that tiny URL and uh, you can also view that tiny URL right here. Um, to vote now. And while uh, this is up uh, for you to go and vote, you don't have to vote yet. You can vote anytime between now and the end of the panel, right before we announce the winners. So if you're still undecided, wait for these closing remarks, maybe ask a question in the chat uh, and, uh, and, and, and we'll see who the winner is. So again, you can vote anytime in the next 20 minutes using this URL. And I think we'll just go with our closing statements and we'll go in the reverse order that we did the opening statement. So Evan, why don't you give us your closing statement for exoplanets? Right. So I think exoplanets make uh, the strongest case when we're talking about looking for life elsewhere in the universe, simply due to a matter of numbers. Uh, we have a limited number of uh, bodies within our solar system, but the number of exoplanets that are that have been discovered uh, far, far outweigh that, the number that are in our own solar system and is growing every day. Uh, our abilities to detect and characterize these exoplanets um, with telescopes such as James Webb, Louvoir, HabEx, so on and so forth, uh, are also getting better every day. And um, I think the combination of the number of exoplanets, the different kinds of environments that we have found and are going to be finding, um, and our improving ability to characterize uh, and, and really look at these planets, I think it's really just a matter of time uh, before we discover a habitable planet or a planet that is in fact inhabited. Thank you, Evan. Um, and thank you to those in the chat who uh, have notified me that you need permission to view this form. I will fix that and we will continue with our closing statements. Uh, so Lucas, why don't you go next? Sure. Um, so Enceladus is a really enticing candidate uh, in the search for life. It's got a deep ocean of liquid water that chemically it's also really a lot like Earth's oceans in terms of um, the salt, the organic molecules, even the acidity of the ocean. Um, and since Earth's oceans are teeming with life, Enceladus seems like one of the logical next places to look. Um, in particular, there's evidence for hydrothermal activity at the bottom of the ocean, which produces organic molecules and gases that can provide both building blocks and a source of energy for life. Um, and not only might Enceladus be a likely place for life to exist, it's also one of the best places to actually go looking for it, thanks to the eruptions that bring stuff that's in the ocean all the way to the surface and beyond. Um, so we can fly through the eruptions or just stand nearby and maybe catch preserved Enceladian life in a snowflake. 
Uh, wonderful. I believe I've just opened up the uh, poll to everybody. If somebody could type in the chat whether or not they were successful in that or still having problems, that would be useful. And uh, for Europa, uh, let's have that final uh, statement from Adriana. All right. So I really just feel that Europa has so much going for it. It has an entire liquid saltwater ocean. It has promising chemistry, as we can see kind of from the chaos terrains and also by being just bombarded by junk from Jupiter and Io, which is very volcanically active, that creates all these oxidants that can be subducted into the ocean environment. And it likely has hydrothermal vents too. And the bonus, it's right in our solar system. And then you add to that some location and age advantages it has over Enceladus, and you just have a very promising locale for life. And we can clearly observe not only chemosynthetic life on Earth, but also all this life, especially microbial life, flourishing in these cold ocean environments like our Arctic. So therefore, I think it's really not a stretch of the imagination to believe that similar life forms could exist on Europa. So this is why with our current technology and the planned missions that I talked about, um, many of which are in prototype stage and just ready to go, I believe that Europa is the best place to look for life in our universe. So vote Europa. <laughs> Excellent. And finally, take us home or close to home, uh, Trent. Yeah. So Mars. Um, so like I said before, the key is ancient Mars. Um, it's got liquid water flowing on the surface, implying an Earth-like climate. Uh, Mars and Earth are basically made from the same material, accreting from similar parts of the solar nebula. And the point is, you've got a bona fide secondary Earth that is your neighbor in the solar system, just give or take a couple billion years of timing. Um, and if there's one thing that we know about life is that it perseveres. Extremophiles live in every nook and cranny on Earth, every environment that you could imagine. Um, it's hard to go somewhere where you won't find life. And so I think it's very plausible uh, that given Mars's early Earth-like conditions, uh, that the life that did hopefully did form on Mars would persevere um, till today, just like the rover. And uh, I think that makes Mars yeah, the best place to look for life on Earth. All right. In the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, let's take some questions from the chat now. So I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly, um, but I'll try my best. So Zijun He says, what kind of life would you expect to find? Would it be possible to find multicellular life? And for the sake of time, I just want to go and ask, would you expect to find multicellular life on your planet? And so let's go with Trent. Mars, would you find multicellular life or would it be unicellular? I would say unicellular, probably. Um, okay. Yep. Uh, and your, uh, Europa? Um, I would say maybe multicellular, but we'd need to do a lot more studies of like the amount of chemistry and like amount of uh, oxidants that are available. I'd say like unicellular is a safer bet. Okay. And Celidus. I would also go unicellular um, in particular because we know the gases uh, and oxygen was not measured in those eruptions. So oxygen being pretty key for multicellular life. Excellent. And exoplanets. So this one's a little tough because as I said, there are thousands of exoplanets out there. Uh, the number of kind of environments uh, really kind of knows no bounds. Uh, there could be exoplanets that have, uh, you know, full functioning multicellular life that look something like our own or multicellular life that looks very different from our own. Um, but as my fellow panelists have said, uh, single celled life, unicellular life uh, is a little easier to, to form and to maintain. So I think that would be the more likely case uh, that we would find on exoplanets. Very interesting. Okay, next question comes from Anandita Mandal, who says some places on Earth have liquid water, but don't favor life. So how can we be assured that liquid water present on other planets can harbor life? Anyone want to take a stab at that one? I could, I could potentially open that up. Um, 
So you're absolutely right that there are places um, on Earth that don't uh, that have water and a lot of water that don't support life. Um, however, it's water being a, a vital ingredient to life as we know it, um, and the fact that um, basically in our search for life. Astrobiologists really have one data point uh, to look at, and that's Earth. It's the only place we know of that does support life. Um, and with water being essential, um, you know, not, not all water contains life, but all life as we know it contains water or uses water. Um, I think that makes the case very strong that um, if we were going to find life anywhere, looking for places where there are or there is liquid water um, is going to be a good bet. I think that's a pretty uh, good answer. Does anybody have one, uh, anything to add to that? If not, that's fine. We'll move on. David McGuire asks, if there are other different chemicals present on your world, would that make different forms of life? Or is there anything special about carbon-based life? Um, I can talk about that for, for a second. Um, so uh, once again, the kind of reliance on looking for carbon-based life is uh, another instance of this N equals one problem where life is only found on earth and we can only study this. Um, and so uh, carbon is, is definitely our best bet for life on earth and because it can form long chains um, and create uh, the building blocks of cells and life as we know it here. Um, other hypotheses for the basis of life like silicon, um, for example, is one that gets thrown out um, a lot. They are interesting and certainly you cannot definitively rule them out. Um, but the kind of exotic forms of chemistry and the environments that you would find uh, a life form of that nature, um, I, like, frankly, I don't know where, where you could find that. And perhaps exoplanets would be um, where you could find some more exotic things. Um, in the solar system, it'd be fascinating to find non-carbon based life, if life at all. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, we have some questions about some places in the solar system that we haven't talked about yet. So Jeffrey Needle asks about Titan. It has an abundance of organic compounds on the surface, including lakes and rivers of liquid methane and ethane. It has water ice on the surface and liquid water beneath the crust, all of which is correct. So what about Titan? Does anybody want to talk about Titan? Uh, yeah, I could talk a little bit about Titan. Um... And that was definitely an honor honorable mention to be represented on this panel. Um, uh, so yeah, th those points that um, Jeffrey brought up are all great. There, uh, Titan has an atmosphere with all these uh, hydrocarbons and uh, lakes and seas of liquid hydrocarbons too. Um, and well, so you know there's carbon around. So in that sense, maybe carbon-based life would be favored. Um, it is kind of interesting, though, that you have this liquid phase uh, that is also made of hydrocarbons. Um, so it does sort of beg the question of, like, could you have, could Titan be a place to look for a, a slightly different from Earth-like chemistry in that maybe water doesn't fill or water isn't kind of the solvent that, that all life is existing in, but these hydrocarbon lakes um, could maybe be the solvent as well. Um, although as uh, was also pointed out, there's a ocean, potentially an ocean of liquid water under the surface too. Um, so you could have interactions maybe between the surface and the subsurface. Um, there's a lot of exciting potential for Titan. Absolutely. And another world in our solar system was asked about by Dr. Jem Yin Joy, who asks, what about Venus, especially given the recent NASA uh, recent results uh, of the detection of phosphine in that atmosphere? And could there be atmospheric microbes on that world? Would anybody like to tackle Venus? I can talk a little bit about Venus, even though I'm not by any means an expert on the whole uh, phosphine discovery. Um, but basically, um, to kind of recap, Venus is an extremely hot planet because of the runaway greenhouse effect. Um, but it's been hypothesized that there could be some form of life floating at about 50 to 60 kilometers up 
where it's a little bit more hospitable. Um, and the recent study that's been talked about is that there was phosphine gas found in the middle layer of Venus's atmosphere. And this is a toxic, stinky gas that's commonly found in places like swamps, and it's also produced by some types of non-oxygen breathing or anaerobic bacteria. Um, so obviously this discovery sparked a lot of excitement. Um, the thing is that phosphine gas can also result from several processes that are unrelated to life, such as lightning, meteor impacts, and even volcanic activity. Um, but the excitement came from the fact that the quantity of the phosphine they detected um, seemed to be far greater than those processes are capable of generating. Um, but as far as I know, it, it requires a lot more study um, to be sure, just because we've only had a handful of missions that have sampled from or landed on Venus. So we need to be more sure of these processes first before we can definitively say, yes, this phosphine is coming from a biological source. Wonderful. Okay. I am going to close the poll in three minutes. So you have three minutes left. I will warn you again when there's only one minute left. So if you're still on the fence, you have a couple more questions. And we have so many questions. Oh my goodness. I don't think we'll be able to get to them all. Um, one question comes from... <laughs> oh, there's, some of these are really funny, actually. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's take this one. Uh, Jeffrey, again, asks, the, the Trappist planets that you talked about, Evan, do any of them have an atmosphere that can allow for the detection of biosignatures? Yes, so great question, Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, I think there, so the study on Trappist one is is still ongoing. Um, we think that due to the the size of the star, um, Trappist one is what's known as an M star, um, which tend to be very, very active. They're very volatile stars um, for a much longer period in their life. Uh, than stars like our own sun. And so uh, it's possible that any, any atmosphere that existed around the planets that are closer in to TRAPPIST-1, uh, if they had an atmosphere, that that volatility from the star potentially could have stripped the atmosphere away and, and blown it off into space. Um, the, I suppose the, um, the prospects for atmospheres get better the further you go out from a star, but that has to be balanced with uh, the habitable zone and the amount of energy uh, that, that these planets are receiving. Um, so I, I can't say anything definitively, um, but I think there, there's a good case to be made for um, the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Uh, Trappist D, E, and F, uh, which are in the habitable zone, uh, and that's certainly an ongoing an ongoing study to figure out whether or not their atmospheres, and then we will look for biosignatures within them. Wonderful. Uh, one last question, and I'm going to close the poll in one minute. So get those votes in, everyone. This question is from Abby and is about Europa. So Adriana, is the radiation level on Europa too high for life? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, Europa is getting bombarded by a lot of high intensity uh, radiation on the surface. Um, however, it's good that there is an ice shell because ice, um, especially with how thick we expect it to be on Europa, um, at least like at least several thousand kilometers, um, it would block a lot of that radiation. So in terms of affecting life on the surface, um, we already have a very, very thin atmosphere that probably wouldn't be conducive to life up there. Um, so the radiation would make it even less likely. But in terms of life in the ocean, um, the radiation wouldn't affect it as much. All right, while I close the poll and uh, uh, bring up the results, I'm gonna let Trent answer this one last question. So Seth asks, could Mars be adapted to host life today? And the poll is closing. Yeah, great question, Seth. Um, and a difficult question too. Um, so. First, by adapting to life today, you have to define exactly what life you want to adapt for. Um, for example, it might be finely adapted for microbes that have lived there for forever. Um, and it might be finely adapted for microbes that we kind of bring with us on our spacecraft. Um, but if we're worried about human life, for example, and, and kind of this concept of terraforming Mars, um, it gets much more difficult. Um, one of the 
I mean, there's myriad challenges and a couple of them are first the kind of toxic nature of Mars's soil chemistry as far as maybe sustaining ourselves with uh, botany like in the Martian. Um, but one of the greater threat challenges is creating an atmosphere that can warm Mars up. Um, currently Mars atmosphere is less than 1% the size of ours and it would need to be even larger than ours, uh, much more carbon dioxide or some other means of creating a substantial greenhouse effect. Um, because uh, as some of you may know, Mars is further away from the sun. And so it's just simply just getting less energy. Um, and so all of these challenges and many I haven't even mentioned are monumental and theoretically challenging. We don't know if we can do them. They're materialistically challenging. We don't even know if we can get the materials to do them um, once we dream it up. Um, however, at some point in the very distant future, I'd say, once we get a handle on a lot more physics and a lot more planetary science, I wouldn't necessarily rule it out, um, but this is centuries, maybe millennia. <laughs> All right. And everyone, are you ready for the results of our poll? The best place to look for life in the universe. Can I get a drum roll, please? Drum roll on Zoom. Here <laughs> we go. Here are the results. So we have in fourth place, well, actually, okay, in fifth place was all of the above. <laughs> One brave person wrote, it's not fair because we don't yet know enough about any of them, especially exoplanets, to include or exclude any one of them. That person wins the Mike Wong Award for enlightenment. Um, but <laughs> the rest of you said 16.4% exoplanets. And I actually can't even see the number. Is that 23.9%? Sorry, my Zoom window is blocking. 23.9% for Enceladus. Europa in second place with 28.4%. And by a hair's width, a razor edge, Mars in first place with 29.9%. Thank you all for participating and for giving us the answer of where is the best place to look for life in the universe. If you're sitting down at your computer or at your TV right now watching us, please give a round of applause to our panelists for an excellent job, well done. That was brilliant from all of them, and uh, they deserve all of uh, the praise in the universe. Um, and I want to advertise now the next panel in our series. Uh, so these, this is a series of big questions in the universe. We just tackled searching for life and where is the best place to do that. But there is another pressing question that we need to ask next, which is what even is life and how did it begin? And this will occur on June 14th at 6 p.m. Pacific and will feature, again, University of Astrobiology, uh, University of Washington astrobiologists, uh, Zoe Todd, Nick Wogan, Zach Cohen, and an alumna from our program, Professor Rika Anderson, who is now a professor at Carleton College. Uh, once again, I'll be moderating that. And uh, we look forward to having you there. Now I did, uh, uh, Make, want to make sure there's time now uh, for, for our panelists from tonight to actually uh, say where you can find them on the internet. If you want to follow up with questions or just follow their amazing scientific journeys as they try to uncover the mysteries of the universe. So let's just go in order of distance from Earth. Trent, where can people follow you on the internet? Yeah, my uh, Twitter is exotrent, so E-X-O Trent little traitorious towards my uh, Mars home planet here. Um, but yeah, from there, uh, yeah, please reach out and DM me or follow me or anything. And I'd be happy to talk more about anything astrobiology. Adriana, you're next. Yeah, so I'll give out my Twitter handle as well. Mine is at astro underscore AGB. That is me on Twitter. And again, also please feel free to DM me or reach out from there. All right, Lucas. Um, I am at Fife Beyond Earth on Twitter. Um, so that's all lowercase, all one word. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out. Excellent. Evan. All right. So it appears I'm the only panelist here who does not have a Twitter. Uh, so I suppose I should get on that. Um, if you have burning questions, you can send them to my Instagram account, um, astro.evan, all lowercase. 
and, and I will probably now be making a Twitter account uh, under the same name <laughs> if it's still available. Um, and so you can send questions to either uh, either that Instagram account, again, astro.evan, or in the near future, uh, the Twitter account with the same name. And I am Mike Y on Twitter, M-I-Q-U-A-I. You can also follow UW Astrobiology on Instagram. That's UW uh, UW dot astrobiology. Um, and so until June 14th, um, we'll see you out there. <laughs>